Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think um, I think at this point, um, Bible Discovery Group is um, starting um, for for any of the the young people. If I didn't miss that earlier on, and we will continue um, with um, continuing to think really of God's faithfulness, His grace, and His blessings. Um, and I have the privilege of speaking on one of my own favourite um, Bible verses today. Now. You might be think, forgiven for thinking it's not one of the most um, common and um, favorite Bible verses and perhaps even a little bit um, unusual. Where does this go? Um, have a read. It's what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the reason I've chosen these verses is because they're very much um, a part of my own story. They're about a turning point, a turning point in the book of Romans and a turning point that was there in my own life. This is not just about theory in the Bible. It's very personal and resonates my sense of what God has done in my life. I was thinking of what it's like um, to be trapped, um, like trapped in this, this cave here. And some of you will know stories and movies. Maybe it's Indiana Jones. Maybe it's the famous five where people are stuck and trapped in a place where there is no way out. And then they discover that indeed there is a way out. There is some trap door. Somebody has let down a rope. There is a shaft of light coming in from the roof and there is a way and that's very much my story apologies if um if some of you have heard this before but um when i was a child i started out um loving god and knowing god and wanting to do the things of god in fact for me um the ideal would have been to have a set of rules and to follow them that's just the way um, I probably like things to be very clear cut. That would be my concept of religion. And I looked at God's rules and I thought, yeah, I'm going to try and follow these. I'm going to try and do what God wants. And I'm going to try and live a life that pleases God. But oh, how I struggled. I mean, if you just take, for example, to love your neighbor as myself, to love my family even as myself was something that I struggled with day by day, to consider their needs and their desires equal to my own was something that the harder I tried, the more I just mucked up. The more I'd get up in the morning resolved to try and do the right thing. And I'd end up by 10 o'clock frustrated by that fact that that thing was unattainable. I couldn't be who God wanted me to be. I couldn't follow a set of laws because I was trapped and trapped in a pit of sin. That was my experience for, for, for some years and it was therefore um, a real breath of fresh air when I heard a different um, message of who God was or how God um, can deal with us. And this was at Villa Park in um, 1984 when I heard um, Billy Graham speak. And he spoke of a savior, of one who reaches down into that pit. As we sang this morning, one who when I was lost, he came and rescued me. For once it was a message, not that I needed to do something, or to be something, but that Jesus was all I needed. I needed to trust that he had come into this dark place, into this trap, into this cave to deal with me, that he had paid the price for me to be forgiven. He died in place of me and given, taken that punishment that was mine or is ours and that he offered his spirit to help us to be who he created us to be, 
I'd probably heard this message before, but that was the night that my eyes were open. That was the night that the shaft of light came in and I received Jesus as my savior and found that Jesus was the answer to this problem. It may sound familiar. In fact, it's very much the message that Ian preached last week, that Jesus is the answer. And what I'd just like us to think about this morning is to take that message personally, to apply it to ourselves. Do we take Jesus to heart? Do we know what we have been saved from? Do we know who we really are in Jesus? And it's this verse in Romans that, um, that I discovered a few years later um, when I was in my teens and I re realized this was my story and it was right there in the Bible, in Paul's own words in Romans chapter seven. And it really summed up that turning point um, <clears throat> when you think about the pickle that we are in, in the human condition. And I'd like to unpack that a little bit further by looking back in Romans 7 um, into what Paul says as he come, builds up to this verse. He talks about a problem, and he talks about a problem which is called sin, about a rebellion against God's ways, about the consequences of selfishness, evil, depravity, and fallenness. And the more we're aware of something being wrong, the more sometimes we can just be allured to that thing which is forbidden. Paul writes, for I would not have known what coveting was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. It's that very fact that once you know something's wrong, it almost seems even more attractive. And the result of that is not just that there is something in the world that we call sin. It's not just this depravity that I think the world recognizes. You ask anybody and they'll say there's things that are not right with this world. But we need to acknowledge our part in that, that we personally are guilty um, of sin. And Paul describes that part in it perfectly. He says, I do not understand what I do, but what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. This illusion that even though we might want to do the right thing, we might recognize the difference between good and evil, we lack the strength to do the right thing. And we end up rather in some kind of destructive spiral. I think we can probably all recognize situations where we see the destructiveness of selfishness and sin in relationships in our own lives. And as Paul says, it don't, doesn't only destroy us, this ends in death. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death, Paul says a few verses earlier. And he describes there a hopeless situation, one we can do nothing to save ourselves from, we're often taught, aren't we, in our culture to think about positive thinking and have good self-esteem and see um, how we can um, find our own way out of it, to dig deep inside and find the resources to address the situation. And for some situations, this, this can work, but I believe there's a place where each of us needs to end up before God and recognize there are things we cannot fix. There's a place where we end up in tears, either literally or metaphorically saying, this is a wretched situation that I'm in and I'm part of that. We realize our hopelessness. We realize the gravity of our sin and we realize we're in a pickle. Paul describes this as he says, I find this law at work, although I want to do good, Evil is right there with me. 
for in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Prisoner, um, that idea of being in chains, that's how Paul describes this situation. And also in the terms of being a slave, I'm unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. That's the depth of that pit. And in that, there is a cry from the heart when we reach that place, isn't there? And this is the cry that we see here. What a wretched man I am in verse 24. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? John Newton, many of you know him and the story um, which goes behind the hymn um, which he penned the original words to, Amazing Grace, and how he was embroiled in the slave trade, um, having um, come out of the Royal Navy, and he served on a ship called the Greyhound. Um, one night in a storm, he started to realize that he needed God and he cried out to God thinking that they were going to be saved. And that was the beginning of a journey. So I thinking they were going to be lost. I'm sorry. And God actually saved them from that storm after four weeks at sea. And that was the beginning of his journey towards God. He became then um, an advocate of abolishing the slave trade. He became a um, vicar in the Church of England, but most of all, he realized um, what he'd been saved from, and he used that word, same word as Paul, that he'd been saved from being a wretch. The hour I first believed, he says, in that song. And I suppose that's what I'm thinking about today, that hour when I first believed is what's resonated in this verse. And that's what I'd like to encourage each of us to do is to think back to that hour when we first believed, when we first realized who Jesus was to us, what he had saved us from. Verse 25 continues, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's like, isn't it, that shaft of light that suddenly comes in at the end of this chapter of wretchedness in chapter 7. And we see that actually God has done what we cannot do. God has done this. Thanks be to God, it says, who delivers me through Jesus Christ, who paid our punishment and who paid a way to life in which we can follow him and we can call him Lord, not just accepting him as our savior, but also as our Lord. And from this point, um, Paul describes then a um, solution to the problem, one that starts then with, the, with Christ and the Holy Spirit, most importantly. He says that we are, um, what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. So that's how Jesus was an offering in our place. And he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. When we accept Jesus, then God promises the Holy Spirit. And in that, we may be declared righteous before God. That is just so amazing that when we are guilty, Jesus has done what it takes to declare us righteous. There is no condemnation, therefore, for those who are in Christ Jesus. That slate has been wiped clean. That guilt has gone. And it is final. It's not just something 
that God wipes once, but it is something that is effective for all time. And not only that, he gives us his spirit, which enables us then to set our minds on what the spirit desires. It says here in a few verses later, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. When we accept Jesus as our Lord, then his spirit comes and reorientates our hearts towards him and makes us actually want to do the things that God loves. And from this life in the spirit flows then life and peace, we are told. A mind governed by the spirit is life and peace in Romans chapter 8, verse 6. And later on in chapter 8, perhaps one which is a famous um, verse um, for, for, for being one of people's favorites are those verses about being victorious. And I've just picked a few of them here. For if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Another popular concept these days is resilience, isn't it? Where often people talk of, about that and the fact we need to be resilient. And I think we probably all had our resilience tested in these months of COVID. But these verses later on in chapter eight, they describe a resilience that's beyond any kind of self-assurance. They describe a situation where nothing can separate us from the love of God, whatever happens even as the receivers of this letter, they experience huge persecution. They were to know that in these things, they can be secure in God. And who are they then? If we were slaves and prisoners, then we are free and children, Paul says. Through the Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit gave us life and set you free from the law of sin and death. There's a freedom that comes not only that, he calls us his children. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. All these ideas then come out there in chapter 8. So there, there we have it. The problem of sin and the solution that Jesus has wrought in Jesus and giving us his Spirit. And I'd like us just to conclude by just pondering this for a minute. Sometimes we spend a lot of time, don't we? And rightly so, rejoicing of what God has done here on the, the right-hand side. But if we don't always remember where we have come from, then sometimes that loses its context, doesn't it? Jesus himself um, in the Beatitudes talks about the attitude with which we approach God. And here are just some of those things, particularly the early Beatitudes. They speak of us being poor in spirit, realizing that we don't have the answer. There's nothing we can do. Being meek, mourning, because we are in a trap of death and hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And that was the point I was at that night. I was just desperate. I was at the end of my tether saying, God, look, there must be something that can get me out of this trap and the hunger to hunger and thirst for righteousness in Christ, they will be filled. And from that flow then being merciful, being peacemakers, being pure in heart. When we see that in, when we receive that in Jesus, it's a transformation. Our life is going a completely different direction. And Paul illustrates this at the beginning of chapter 7, starting the whole passage by talking about marriage, about somebody whose spouse dies, and then they marry somebody else. And that does impact every facet of their lives. Those of us who are married will know it affects where we live and what we eat and what we wear, even our work and our, our leisure. 
And we have to think about that. When we receive Jesus, it is like having being remarried to a new spouse and suddenly you've got a different focus for your life. Let's just read that verse one more time in conclusion. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to remember who we are in our human nature before you. We want to acknowledge our struggle with sin, that we have been wretched, prisoners trapped in a place from which there is no escape and we want to acknowledge our utter dependence on the rescue that you offer in Jesus as our only way out. Thank you for Jesus Christ, thank you for giving us a saviour, thank you for reaching down into that pit to rescue us, thank you for paying that sacrifice Thank you that we can be forgiven. Thank you that we can be declared righteous, that we can know life, that we can know peace, that we can know resilience and victory of eternal life, that nothing can separate us from that love. Thank you that not only are we free, but you call us children. We are in a relationship with you. And we thank you that your Holy Spirit is our counselor to walk alongside us. Thank you. We want to thank you, each one of us, for the turning points in our lives. Thank you that you have turned our lives towards you in Jesus and provided us with a way back to God. And we thank you in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Now, maybe that's the first time that um, you've um, had an opportunity to pray that. Um, maybe you still haven't ever prayed that and you're still pondering it. And I just encourage you to share that with, um, with, with somebody if you prayed that for the first time or just continue to seek God. Let him bring you to that place where we can pray that prayer and turn to God. Thank you, Sarah.